So welcome everyone to this webinar linked with the 23rd International Mental Health Nursing Research Conference 2017. So this is our first year under a new name, but we have a very long tradition of innovation and inquiry in nursing research. So today we hope to give you a taster of the keynote speeches from this year's conference. Hopefully you'll be finding that these are inspirational and informative. I'm joined by a number of esteemed colleagues who will be talking about their work and vision for mental health care during the course of the conference. The conference, as you know, is in Cardiff next week and we're all really, really excited about some of the developments that we have over the course of the few days. And of course, we're supported by the Mental Health, who, alongside Ben Hannigan, is managing our tweets. So. At, any, at some point during, the, during this webinar, you might hear Ben or Andre pop up with some of your questions, so keep them coming in. So we'll start now. Each speaker is going to give us a snapshot of their keynote address to start off with, and we'll have some discussion of pressing issues towards the end of the webinar. So we're starting with Michael Coffey, who is a professor, associate professor, or assistant associate professor of mental health at Swansea University. He's going to be talking to us about risk discourse and analysis and identity. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I'm speaking next week at the conference in the uh, Mental Health Nurse Academic UK uh, lecture slot. And, um, and I, I am going to talk about risk assessment and management in, uh, in mental health care and uh, for people who are not uh, immediately aware of what that might be this is part of uh, risk assessments part of care coordination approaches and involves assessment by various means of untoward risk behaviors uh, primarily the focus is on risk to self and to others and I want to talk a little bit about mental health nursing and about some of the problems that risk assessment itself um, as an endeavour for mental health, uh, uh, mental health nurses and for people using services. Um, it seems to me there's momentous outcomes arising from risk decisions made by workers, including uh, uh, outcomes for people who use services, including loss of liberty and other uh, restrictions. Uh, and there, there's a mismatch between sometimes poor supporting evidence for the predictive and protective nature of risk assessment uh, versus the likely negative uh, consequences that can arise from assessments. I'm going to use uh, evidence from, from published studies and the work I've been involved in uh, with others in researching community mental health teams and uh, inpatient services in England and Wales uh, to, uh, to support some of the things I'm going to be talking about. Uh, some of this, uh, some of this work shows that risk assessments are, for the most part, not shared with the person or the families, uh, does not include their views, and that many people are actually unaware um, of any assessment having taken place. Uh, workers, uh, such as mental health nurse, nurses, told us that they don't share risk assessments for fear of upsetting people. Uh, service users told us that uh, risk assessments tend to reference poor outcomes, focus on negative language and that the content can be dark. I think too that the practice of risk assessment reinforces negative uh, images of mental distress and it can act as a further form of oppression in restricting the lives and the liberty of individuals based on assessments of somewhat doubtful validity. Healthcare workers are overly focused on risk uh, and can act in ways that reinforce stigmatised identities and dependence on services rather than supporting independence and recovery. And adding to this, it seems to me there's a significant injustice in denying people access and a contribution to decisions that ultimately affect their well-being. My view is that risk assessment practice is problematic for the profession of mental health nursing, in that it seems to work to create distance between nurses and the people that they're caring for. And the conclusion I've, I've drawn from this is that uh, risk assessment in mental health care, it varies actually very widely in practice, is largely hidden from view and is not open to scrutiny. We don't, know, uh, we don't know how such assessments are being handled and if they're being handled in reliable ways. And it seems to me there's little evidence uh, to support uh, their use. Um, in fact, we, we've concluded in our study that, uh, that they, they operate as fictions produced to uh, address the terrible uncertainties of managing uncertainty in risk behaviours. Uh, I'm 
in my talk, I'm hoping to outline some possible ways in which mental health nursing might advance a more collaborative and involved approach to working with risk and planning for safety. Uh, and th this is based upon a number of things. First of all, that a fundamental principle in mental health nursing is apparently a, the therapeutic relationship. Uh, that risk assessments are unreliable and they tend towards negative outcomes. That risk assessment isn't shared uh, and uh, and is used still for, for quite big decisions. Uh, and it's inconsistent for mental health nurses to withhold involvement if the therapeutic relationship is their, is primary as it, as is claimed. Moreover, it's, it's not only unjust to use faulty assessments for momentous decisions, but there's a fundamental injustice in denying people a contribution to assessments that so clearly affect their long-term well-being. I hope I got that in three minutes. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Michael. That, that was, was great. great. So, so, I suppose, I suppose what, we're, what we're getting from that is that you're talking a little bit about risk needing to be more collaborative and there needing to be more shared decisions <clears> around <throat> risk. And my sense of it is that you're you're talking a little bit about risk being and some of the practice being defensive, although you didn't, I know you've not used that word, but I, that's something that nurses are quite concerned about. Yeah, I mean, I think I am going to talk about defensiveness and there's a, and, and the kind of, um, the focus on, on worry about blame. Right, you know, right. That is an issue. It's, a, it's an issue in risk practice, not just in the mental health system, but more generally in, in across all types of, of uh, organisations. Okay. Well, we'll come back to that if we can later. We might take Joy in now because um, I think some of the some some of Joy's work might resonate with some of yours. Joy is a professor of mental health at UCLan, at uh, the University of Cent Central Lanc Lancashire, and is going to do to present some of her uh, work during the conference around restraint in inpatient services. So, Joy, if you're okay, would you take it away? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think people are already familiar with the fact that I have done quite a bit of work on minimising restrictive interventions, particularly in adult, adult and forensic inpatient services. So it, it's really about trying to take stock of where we're at. It's still a huge agenda um, in the UK, and actually globally it's still a huge agenda, about how we go about reducing coercive and restrictive practices. and. Um, I seem to have become some sort of restraint queen of late. And I seem to have an unhealthy uh, interest in restraint and death. But anyway, nonetheless, uh, the, there are good stories to be told around the world in trying to reduce these things. So some of the, some of the things I'll talk about um, when I sort of open the, the conference on the Thursday is about where, where we're at to date uh, and what we need to do to improve things. Um, and particularly, I'm going to talk about... Uh, I suppose a, a pretty much a landmark study in the UK that we've recently just completed uh, over the last two years looking at something called the Six Core Strategies, which is an organisational model that endeavours to reduce the use of restraints and other restrictive interventions by um, a whole raft of aspects. Uh, I mean, I, in some ways it, it aligns a little bit to things like safe wards, but, but moving on from what Michael has said, I, I guess, that, that one of the things or one of the strategies is around using person-centered tools with service users and so therapeutic alliances is, is hugely important and huge, hugely significant. But the, the things I will be particularly talking about is how we adapted the six core strategies, which is basically an American model, how we adapted it to the UK setting mm -hmm. uh, and subsequently produced a toolkit and a benchmarking tool uh, and other things that I think people will find very useful. But the key strategies that I'll be talking about are leadership, something called, um, well, not something called, but workforce development, something called data-informed practice. I've already mentioned person-centered tools. The whole issue of service user involvement and, and how that can be effective in minimizing restrictive interventions in institutions. And finally, the, the notion of debriefing. So they're, they're the six strategies. It, it's far more complex than that. <laughs> and it requires a great deal of investment from staff. But we basically found, having rolled this out across the Northwest, um, and we called it Restrain Yourself, we basically found significant reduction in the use of restraints in the uh, inpatient settings that we use. So I'm, I'm quite excited about it. 
um, and it'll be the, the, the first time that I've, I suppose, very formally presented the results of Restrain Yourself. That's fantastic, Joy. It'll be really interesting to hear about that, and perhaps we'll come back to that later before you have to head off. Okay. Um, I suppose, you know, one of the things that you're, that's resonating with Michael's talk is the, the issue around person-centeredness. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely. Collaborative yeah. care. Yeah, and, and therapeutic alliances, and I'm not just talking about it, but how you actually affect that and how you do it. Um, and I think uh, it's still it's still a very difficult thing to um, to pinpoint. Sometimes exactly we talk about therapeutic alliances, but I, I think sometimes people don't necessarily know what that looks like uh, or how to to do it. And that sounds quite bizarre for mental health nurses. Um, but I, I, hopefully there's lots of strategies that I can um, I can share with people at the conference. Okay, okay. So perhaps I might I might move to to Jay now to talk a little bit about her work. Um, I know that uh, this is Dr. Jay Watt, who is a consultant psychologist, um, who's going to talk a little bit about person centeredness and trauma informed research which is going to be quite topical for us because this is a research conference something that's that, that that's really at our at the forefront of our minds can i just make sure you can hear me okay because i know we had problems earlier yeah we yeah. can excellent um well what i'm going to do is, is is basically just a three minute summary now is i'm going to start off really by by saying why it matters which is linking what we're going to be talking about or what i'm going to be talking about with the number of bereavements the number of coroner's reports that show us the difficulties that people are experiences the death that are being caused by some of our ideas that well intentioned though they might be a, 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 a really can be very very damaging and i'm going to focus on um on, on the diagnosis of uh, borderline personality disorder uh, and really spend the first kind of half of our time together really kind of looking at how that can actually as an idea as a construct get in the way of really kind of good enough care so we're going to be looking a little bit about iatrogenic trauma. So iatrogenic trauma is trauma that is actually caused by or made worse by contract with psychiatric services. So for example, we're going to be thinking about things like what might happen. We know that there's a very, very high incidence, say, of sexual abuse, neglect for clients who are given the label of borderline personality disorder. They are then treated very, very often as manipulative, as attention seeking. And those kind of ideas, those kind of attitudes, which survivors have been telling us for decades, which qualitative research shows us and quantitative research happens as clear as day, how that can actually block people being received and tended to as people who are struggling and desperately trying to survive. And what we find instead and what research and survivors are telling us is that actually the idea of borderline personality disorder can actually end up reinforcing, re-victimizing people by underlining some of the messages that pretty much caused the damage in the first place. So for example, if you get an abused woman who is cutting and they've been told by an abuser early on that they're doing that, you know, that actually other people will be able to cope with it, that's a particular problem with them. If they are then told that their very personality is disordered, which service users are telling us is really the kind of ultimate character slur, well, what can we expect apart from really ambivalent responses to services? So we're going to be looking at that and then moving on from that really to think, well, okay, if this construct is so damaging to so many people and has been for so many decades, is there really a kind of like sort of super good scientific justification for that? And so we're going to be looking at the category of borderline personality disorder and thinking about whether it meets kind of minimum criteria, really, for a scientific construct. And that's things like, you know, does it stand up by itself? Is it kind of a distinct category? Are there particular symptoms? Does it predict a particular treatment? Does it predict a particular course? Uh, and really, that is very, very kind of problematic in terms of this construct, which is one of the reasons why in the next DSM, in the next SMD, it's pretty much going to go. But in terms of the alternatives that are being propounded, 
survivors and researchers telling us that actually those are going to be really problematic. And even though the new words might be put on it, the same prejudices, the same blame, the same judgment is going to be getting in the way of helping and healing, which is what we are fundamentally there for, which is what we all want, which is what we're paid for. And so the second half is really going to be looking at trauma-informed care as an alternative paradigm. And that is really kind of moving Yes, it's very, very focused and very particularly important with borderline personality disorder because the character slur, because the damage is pretty much the worst. But actually we know, and I know many of my colleagues that are speaking now know this, the trauma rates, say in psychosis, across the general mental health community, community are so high that ethically, I'm going to argue, and many of us are arguing internationally, trauma-informed care really needs to be a new paradigm that we think about. So we're going to be looking a little bit then in the second half of the evidence base for trauma-informed care, um, really thinking a little bit about what that looks like in practice, some initiatives that have started in the UK, and really also kind of doing that focusing on a much larger expanded idea of trauma. So really we're going to talk about four different types of trauma. There's the PTSD that we've known a lot about since the 80s. There's the idea of complex trauma or complex PTSD that has been coming in in the last 10 or 15 years. Both great, incredibly important. We need more understanding about that. But we're also going to bring in thirdly socio-political trauma. So, for example, all of us know, really, end of the day, things like poverty, being treated like shit, being treated like nothing, those screw people up. And so we want this shift to be more than just a shift from, you know, what is wrong with you to what has happened to you. Mm -hmm. Think about the question, OK, how can we meet service users and how can we think about what has happened to you in terms of perhaps the damage we've done as psychiatric services, the damage society and neoliberalism has done, the damage things like abuse, neglect and what have you have done, and try and find the packages of putting those all together. And I'm going to be bringing in at the end some really exciting ideas from across the country and internationally. Great, thank you, Jay. One of the things that you know, certainly when I read your speaker form, one of the things that I found quite quite useful, and I think kind of links with some of the other talks that we're having over the course of the couple of days, was just this notion that you have of moving from that kind of problem focused talk to talk that would be more facilitative and more helpful for clients. Can you tell me a little bit more about that in terms of research? I mean, I think it's, it's one of the most exciting things that's happening now research wise. So if we look at the kind of, you know, the biggest journals that get the most press is we've got very exciting research coming in about information. And really what that is showing us is, and this links with Joy's points about therapeutic relationships and how actually we don't know nearly as much about relationships and how they can harm and how they can heal as we would like to think. So really in terms of the research, we've got, you know, as everyone knows here, the, the biggest research studies are the longitudinal perspective ones that have, have happened for decades. And we'll be talking about something called um, the ACE study, which is a massive, thousands and thousands, huge 15-year study, which is basically showing the things that we've been talking about in terms of trauma, developmental trauma, societal trauma, artogenic trauma, they show up in the body and in terms of healing and the evidence base and data in terms of what heals, actually we really need to thicken and complicate and be survivor led in terms of what makes good therapeutic relationships that heal. Because if we know if, if we don't do that, that shows up you know, in the body, it shows up in the psyche, it shows up relationally. And our first task then needs to be moved to therapeutic relationships that are, you know, less about protecting us as professionals by kind of othering the person through, okay, they're ill, let's have this category list, let's stay away from the distress to recognise actually that, you know, things can be incredibly difficult to talk about, that none of us can actually put things into words until we feel safe, and that things like safety, and this links with um, what we were talking about earlier in terms of things like restraint, that has to be our number one priority. We have to understand that in an embodied way, we have to understand that in a systemic way, and we have to understand that as well in terms of the messages that all of us send, right through from nursing assistants to, you know, receptionists to absolutely everyone, which is going to be one of warmth and understanding and openness. Can I, can I just quickly interject there and just say that's brilliant, Jay, because um, what I didn't say about the six core strategies and restrain yourself is that fundamentally underpinning one of the philosophical 
one of the philosophical ideations is about trauma-informed care and the workforce development very much focuses on trying to re-educate staff about trauma so I mean I think the two things will interject beautifully excellent yeah and that's really well put both joy and Jay um, one of the I think one of the challenges that Gary now has in telling us about his his keynote speech is to try and describe how to maintain that kind of therapeutic relationship through a computerized program and how you mimic that in order to help people and certainly help young people who are experiencing any kind of you know common signs of a common mental disorder so Gary's a professor of psychology and the, the director of the clinical program at University College Dublin welcome Thanks, Lita. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. There, I think hopefully there are some kind of continuities between some of the work uh, we're currently engaged in and some of the, the teams mentioned uh, by the speakers so far. <coughs> um, one of the things that, um, that I'm going to talk about is one of our computer games, which is called Pesky Maths, which is a CBT game for children um, aged between 7 and 15 who have clinically significant anxiety or low mood. And in designing pesky nuts, one of the things we were interested in is how do we use technology within a therapeutic relationship? Um, because usually when people do use, add technology to mental health, they very sensibly think about why don't I build an online program for? And we know in doing that, there's a set, there, there are lots of sensible reasons why people do that. But when you do that, you lose the therapeutic relationship. And those purely online programs have huge difficulties of dropout, of people losing their motivation. So when we designed our children's program, we were interested in not how do we build something that's online, but how do we build something that a therapist can use um, in their everyday practice and that actually draws on all of the qualities of a therapeutic relationship and adds a useful piece of technology uh, to a child's experience of therapy. So in doing that, we were trying to maintain the, the therapeutic relationship and use technology to solve um, other kind of problems in making CPT accessible for children. And the main problem we were trying to, uh, we were trying to address um, was this problem of metacognition in cognitive behaviour therapy. Because think, the, 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 in essence, the cognitive model is that you think about your thinking and how it affects your feelings and your behaviour, which is a complicated thing for an average adult to do, but to ask a seven or an eight-year-old to do that uh, is, is particularly challenging. So in designing Pesky Nats, we thought that a computer game gave us an opportunity to draw on some of the things we know from developmental psychology um, about how children engage in kind of metacognition at, a, at an earlier age. Uh, and embed that within a computer game. So the Nats of the pesky Nats game is that Nats are negative automatic thoughts in the language of CBT, but they're little insects uh, in our computer game. And the player goes to Nats Island and where they discover that there's an island full of negative automatic thoughts or little kind of fly-like creatures. They meet David Nattenborough, who's a world famous explorer, who teaches them how to trap their thinking or set a Nat trap. And they work with David Nattenborough and his team of explorers in not only just setting that traps, but also kind of swatting gnats, and just, which is changing your thinking and hunting them back to their hive, which is discovering what your underlying core belief is. So um, we've kind of taken kind of these kind of ideas of making things concrete, uh, destigmatizing, and putting them within a narrative or a story within the context of a computer game to make these kind of more abstract ideas accessible for children. And the child plays that game with a therapist, so they continue to benefit from all of those advantages of a therapeutic relationship uh, mm -hmm. as they do that. So they get that warmth, that support, that non-judgmental experience. And also the therapist helps them apply those CBT ideas uh, to the anxiety or mood difficulties that they're, they're experiencing as well. So that's um, one of the things that I hope to mention at the, the, the conference. Um, the, the, kind of the second thing that I hope to mention too is the evidence around these programs because we see a huge proliferation of technology uh, for positive mental health or for specific mental health interventions. But there's a lag to the evidence that supports that technology uh, often. So I hope to um, illustrate some of the, 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 the evidence for some of our programs with reference to another game that we've been working on, which is a version of Pesky Nats, but this is for adults with an intellectual disability. And we were interested in making mental health services more accessible to an intellectual disabled population. They usually face barriers to accessing mental health services, but also barriers to accessing technology. Um, so we've recently run a randomised controlled trial of a version of Pesky Nats for adults with an intellectual disability that we've recently published. And the results from that are, 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 are very encouraging. And 
um, that the program helps adults manage their anxiety in a way uh, that, that goes from kind of clinical anxiety to, to normal functioning, and that those gains are maintained over a three-month period at follow-up, uh, and relative to control group who, who we saw no change in over that uh, time period. So I hope to illustrate that it is possible to develop these programs and also develop a research program uh, simultaneously that supports uh, their utility. And then, I suppose for us, and it, it, it relates back to some of the points that, that Jay and Joy have been, uh, have been talking about, is that we think these computer-based technologies have um, huge potential. And one of the games that's currently under development for us at the moment is uh, a game for children who've experienced uh, trauma or who are currently experiencing PTSD. So we're, we're working on a version of the game which is a much, a much expanded kind of computer game world where uh, it has a much more kind of flexible interface um, that allows a therapist to select a unique CBT program that's based on a, on a, on a sound uh, model that, uh, that helps a child manage kind of trauma that they might have experienced. So I, I want to kind of show that kind of work in progress that we're currently engaged in as well. And finally, I think it's always nice if you go to a conference and you take home something that's kind of useful for your everyday practice. So I'll either start or end by kind of introducing some of the freely available materials that we have on our websites and in the iTunes store and on the Google store that people can go and download and use on Monday morning when they get back to work. Uh, if they're that sounds ready. fantastic. Everyone loves a freebie. A freebie is always good, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so, I mean, there's two things that strike me as really interesting from your talk, Ari. I mean, the, I think the second part in, the, in where you were talking a little bit about the, the evidence that we have for these kinds of um, apps, and that was one of the things that we wanted to hit with this conference because some of the clinical feedback we were getting was that people in practice are really struggling to know what to advise people, what to say about some of the apps that are available online. And, and, and then the common kind of, the people on the street have access to so much. Um, do, I mean, could you give us any advice on that? Yeah, it, it's funny, we, we designed a mindfulness and relaxation skills app for children, which is called Mindful Nats. And we went to the iTunes store and we Googled mindfulness in iTunes and we came up with 500 apps that you could potentially use to support your mindfulness. And we went to the Psych Info database of kind of studies. And when we entered mindfulness and apps, we came up with two studies. Uh, so yeah. there, there yeah. is this huge kind of uh, gap. Um, so I, I personally think there's two kind of levels to evidence. One is, has the app been designed to a evidence-based model? Okay, so I think that's the first kind of critique that you can offer. Uh, and it may or may not have been. And then the second question is, well, has anyone done some research to show that this helps you manage whatever it is? And mm -hmm. the answer to the latter question is probably, it's probably unlikely. Um, so we're usually trying to recommend the best of apps that have some kind of theoretical sound foundation as opposed to evidence. And then I think we do have an onus then for there to be research uh, conducted to develop an evidence base for these pieces of technology. Well, you know, that leads quite nicely into my, my second point, or the second thing that I thought was quite interesting about what you were saying was just, you've got a great imagination, and you've got this, this real notion of invention about what you've done. And I suppose I was, I was gonna put it to yourself and the rest of the panel to, to maybe, given that the theme of our conference is around imagination, uh, to perhaps start thinking about what, you know, how healthcare services could look like, could look in 10 years time, given a lot of the developments that are happening. But also, I suppose in a time of challenge, you know, we've got a lot of challenges for mental health, nursing in particular, mostly around, and, and you may not be aware of this, Gary, but mostly around kind of the change in the fee structure here, where previously they used to go to get a bursary, where we're, we're getting quite a lot of conflicting um, political advice from the sort of Jeremy Hunt about the amount of money that's going to be pumped into mental health whilst on the other hand they're taking away the bursaries and we're going to be left with a, with a shortage of bodies to fill roles so there's real challenges but also for science and for research I don't know if you've been watching the debate um, between Stephen Hawking and Jeremy Hunt in the, that's been played out in The Guardian it's been very interesting um, and there's some real concerns that policy is a, is I suppose it's undermining science and cherry picking science in order to, um, I suppose in order to to kind of support policy that may not be evidence based. So I'm just wondering if I could maybe put it to the panel and yourself, Gary, 
Um, how do you see services in 10 years' time, given these challenges? It's a big question. It's a big question. I, 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 I suppose I'll get the, get the ball rolling, maybe. It's just, yeah, I, I think um, ultimately we get what we invest in. And I think if you don't sufficiently invest in the proper training of people and in the proper development of an evidence base, you end up with a much, much poorer system. And I think the return on that investment is always much, much greater than the initial cost of providing that. So for me, I think it's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, if you want a good quality service, if you actually value people in your society and value their mental health, you must invest in that. Um, okay. And what about the rest of the panel? Any thoughts on on that on any thoughts on the imagination that it might need to, to bridge that gap I, I i think can i say something quickly yeah of course and um, i think we have to be kind of careful because we're we're recognizing we have to be because if the phenomena that is hunch that we are and need to be political as workers now some of the computerized therapy stuff i think is fantastic some of the paranoia stuff's brilliant gary's work amazing i love the playfulness in it it's brilliant but we also need to be very very careful because i know a lot of people who are listening to this right now have had direct first experience as so many nurses have of these kind of things and this isn't just computerized therapy it's lots of things it's the recovery agenda too for example being used in a way so research is being used to um kind of sort of take the take the gaze away from other things that matter so much to service users so for example we know the benefit system absolute disaster for the moment we know that that's increased suicide so i think what we need is a new kind of political clinician researcher who goes listen excellent we're going to increase the evidence based on this but for ourselves as ethical humans and also for the clients the people that we serve we're also going to make sure we always do that while saying we're not going to allow you to use that as an excuse to to kind of cut services as say is happening with recovery as potentially it could happen with with computerized therapy in, in iapps so i think i i kind of sort of foresee and hope that in 10 years time we were working far more closely with survivors and actually going okay we're doing this to serve you but we recognize that actually that gives us a responsibility to do kind of social political work as well in terms of making sure mental health and things like nurse anniversary gets the minimum funding it deserves okay so um so that's the really interesting points um, I'm wondering about you, Michael, what are you thinking about in terms of your aspiration for the kind of service that you, what you would like to be seen delivered? Well, I, I, I suppose uh, looking at what's happening to mental health nursing, looking at, looking at the, the, uh, the reduction in the numbers of mental health nurses who are actually on the register in the UK, the reduction in the numbers of people applying to train and with the introduction of the bursary, it's having a particular effect on mental health nursing over other uh, parts of the uh, or, or other branches of nursing because mental health nurses tend to be older coming into training. And so there's actually been a, there's been a change in the, in the uh, demographic of people applying for nurse training on, on this first year of the introduction of the bursary. And I think mental health nursing is going to feel the effect of that very quickly. Um, so my imagination for 10 years time, well, you know, if all things been equal, nursing gets 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 funded properly. People People's uh, work in the NHS as students ought to be paid for, and that should fund their training. And I, I think that's a bit of a political issue at the moment, but I think somewhere along the line, maybe it, things will give on that and we will we will probably return to a basis where we have people been properly funded to do their training. The, there's another challenge and another challenge is, is in the NMC in, in the UK, uh, who continually come back to mental health nursing time and time again with this idea of introducing a generic nurse training, which will take away all of the specialism out of mental health and immediately. And I think that can actually be really quite damaging for the delivery of mental health services. So that needs to, we need to be aware of that politically as well and be ready to respond to that. And I know that mental health nurse academics has been very uh, proactive in its attempts to, to, uh, to engage with the NMC and, uh, and, and other um, providers, um, other people with an interest in this. So that's an issue. I think in terms of risk assessment, I've got a, an issue for a risk assessment, and it's one that we all have to recognise, is that organisations uh, 
are focused on risk assessment for a particular purpose and it isn't the purpose that maybe therapeutics might be interested in. Uh, and it's about, it, it, that is about defensiveness, it is about uh, uh, um, risk averse, it is about trying to protect services, it's about reputational damage. And where you get reputational uh, uh, fears about reputational risks, organisations tend to want to be reassured by frontline workers that everything is being done uh, to, uh, to address what can be done. And mm. the pressure on workers becomes more about addressing the organisational needs and not addressing the person's needs. And I think this is partly why we've got a situation where risk assessments take place and people are largely unaware that they've ever taken place. And actually, they don't even see them. They don't know. They don't understand what's in them and they don't understand what they've been used for. And actually denying people that access to that sort of stuff is problematic. So we, I would like to see mental health nursing kind of step up to the plate a little bit here because a lot of mental health nurses are care coordinators. They are doing these risk assessments. And I think they need to start... Uh, uh, remembering that it is part of our profession to work with people and not do things to people. So this is part of the argument that has been coming out in the last couple of weeks about between um, Stephen Hawking and Jeremy Hunt about how um, the how the services have not just been um, kind of under resourced, but how the policy makers have been cherry picking the uh, the evidence and not choosing the right evidence and not systematically appraising it for designing the services. So having an evidence-based service. But one of the things that is coming up again out of your talk, uh, or, or out of what you're saying, Michael, is parity of esteem is still an issue. Um, and in the, the adult psychiatric morbidity study, we have one in three people seeking or attending mental health services, but we don't see that same level of parity in the delivery of services. Would you have anything to say about that? Well, I think the I think the party of steam was a was a fantastic piece of um, political rhetoric that was ch chucked out a few years ago, and there's been no real uh, attempt, I think, to pay uh, to pay attention to that or to to even to address. It. In fact, I think I think that a lot of the politicians would be really happy if we stopped talking about it. Um, but I think we have to acknowledge that, yes, a, f a fantastic you know, proportion of the population, most people in the population are sometime during their lives are going to have experienced mental distress of some sort, mm -hmm. and yet the services are not funded in, 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 in relation to that. And we also, but mental health services too have a bit of a responsibility here to be producing um, uh, evidence-based practice to be doing things that actually help people and not to be doing things just because it's traditional or is what has always been done and I think we have to we have to uh, we have to take a bit of responsibility to do our, our, our side of it as well. Okay would anyone else like to add any comments on that? Um, I, I suppose one of the things that, 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 that we encounter regularly is the difficulty of doing the quality of research that's required in the clinical setting that sets up a genuine evidence base for what you're doing and what's feasible given the demands of delivering a clinical service. So I think there's a real tension there between those two things. I think, for example, if you, if you have something that's innovative and you wish to evaluate it, you really need to have a, 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 a weightiness control condition or a withheld condition. And I think in the busy context of mental health services, um, it's difficult to, um, to, to get services on board with that. So I think if we really want to do evidence-based work that is innovative and imaginative, I think we're going to have to work more closely between that kind of researchers and clinics about how to address those kind of issues uh, in a way. That's yeah, and I suppose that is one of, the, one of the last questions that I'm going to come to anyway, is just really about, you know, what we can do to become inventors, to become kind of more i know i've already asked you to be imaginative in your practice but how can we be inventive in the way that we deal with people is it that we need to be like jay says really radical and really challenging a lot of the notions that we have in psychiatry a lot of the or within mental health care a lot of the long held notions and really get rid of those kind of labels and um, the constructs that you're talking about like personality disorder do we need to be like that in order to do we need to throw everything out in order to be as inventive or is there something else more subtle that we can do i, I i'm not quite sure about your word subtle so i think we'll we'll, we'll politely disagree about that I think. again sorry 
I think we'll, we'll likely disagree about your use of the word subtle there. Um, I mean, okay. I think in a way the most important thing, or one of the most important things that we need to think about is how we can encourage survivor-led research. And obviously some of the most initiative, you know, original things that have been coming through, I'm thinking about people like Diana Rose's work on ECT, you know, it is survivor-led research. And really a lot of the things that we're doing now, it's excellent we're increasing our evidence base about them, but a lot of the ideas of it from it, actually they were coming through in kind of 70s and 80s activisms. So I think we need to really kind of think, okay, we're moving into an era generally where evidence base is crucial when you take it seriously, but also actually just in general within society, identity politics are on the up. And actually perhaps we can use that to combine that with what we should have been doing all along, which is to put survivor-led research absolutely first and to then follow that and think, OK, well, how can we as professional researchers, how can we as academic researchers back up what is the most important thing, which is the thing coming from this voices? I think that's very, very crucial to do and think about. And I think we also need to be aware of the quite complicated currents about the, in a way, the efficacy of quantitative versus qualitative data right now. We know a lot of the survivor-led um, um, research that comes through is qualitative and, and it's fantastic. But then we know as well, for example, that, you know, there was, I think it was the BMJ recently that said they're not going to publish qualitative data so much. And so actually we need to think, okay, as academics, as researchers, if we are putting survivor voices first, which we should be, well then how can we kind of work with that to make sure that we are creating discursive, practical, and also financial space for that kind of research? Because a lot of the brilliant survivor ideas that are coming through, people are looking around and going, you know, where do we get the money from? And I think one of the things that we need to be doing as academics is going, okay, well, you know, please use our expertise if that's useful to play the, you know, how to get a grant game which, you know, perhaps we've got some training in and then we can use your, you know, your imagination, your experience and what have you to be researching the things that really matter. Mm. So I think in a way it's about imagination and play, fantastic. We need to think about that in quite a complicated way about who gets to be imaginative, if you will, in terms of designing what next. But I think what you're saying is that we need to be more flexible in the type of information that we use to inform the, the services and how they're delivered and how we develop that evidence and that evidence can also it doesn't necessarily have to be so strictly kind of quantitative or qualitative but it has to be something about what's coming from the from the service users or for this from survivors and it has to be it has to be led by them yeah. Yeah. okay so i suppose just to before we wrap up i'm wondering if we might kind of go to our um, tweeters and see if there's any questions that we have for the panel. Hi everybody. Uh, Hi we do. Ben. do we this is Ben Hannigan who is a professor of mental health, a newly made, newly appointed professor of mental health at, at Cardiff, the University of Cardiff um, and he's our resident tweeter. I am um, and I'll be looking forward to welcoming everybody to Cardiff at the International Mental Health Nursing Research Conference next next week. So yes, I have I've been furiously tweeting. My fingertips are burning. Um, I've been trying to summarise the messages that um, people on the panel have been sharing. I have a question um, from John Baker. So John uh, is is well known to the conference. He's well known to Mental Health Nurse Academics UK. He's Professor of Mental Health Nursing at Leeds University, and he has a question particularly for Jay. Um, John, John listened with interest to your point about iatrogenic trauma, Jay, and asks the question, how come we don't know more about this? How come there hasn't been research into this? Mm -hmm. um, I think, well, th thank you for the question. I think it's incredibly important. Um, You know, research, can people hear me okay? My, my screen's yes. gone. I, I, I'll, I'll be careful not to get a paranoid theory about why the screen went at that moment. Um, you know, implicitly all of us, and I very much include myself within that, we can be attracted to doing research that, you know, suits our vested interests and our vested interests as professionals. And it's really kind of difficult, I think, sometimes to recognise, you know, when we're so committed to work and we love our work so much and, you know, client interaction 
what have you, that, that also actually there is a shadow side, which is this damaging iatrogenic side. And so I think that's one reason. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've been looking into this for a long time, that some of the most difficult questions, even though we've got, you know, 40, 50 years of survivors, testimony after testimony and all sorts of coming through, that actually we haven't, in terms of our academic institutions, given enough space to go, you know, actually, okay, you know, we're hearing this again and again, we're damaging. What the what what can we what can we do that's different? And I think one of the problems with that is that we tend not to academically give space to people who refuse services who have been let down by services and then often as participants we know that you know if you've been chronically let down if you've lost a relative because of an attempt they've made when they've been treated i don't know without anesthetic or a &E or what have you it's then very difficult to respond to an information leaflet saying you know come in and tell us kind of how we can help because the experiences have been so damaging there's a kind of mistrust there and i think again you know sorry to emphasize this point but i think it's so important important i think the survivor-led research which we have to fund into our estrogenic responses is so 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 important because there are things that however well intentioned we with our professional hats on are are not going to be able to hear and that survivors can tell one another i think that's one reason we need to step back and actually kind of think okay if there is this amount of data what can we do so that we can hear so, yeah, so I think there has been movement towards, you know, um, being, you know, taking research in a more democratic way um, by asking service users and carers what their priorities are for, ver for, for different areas. And you find that those, those questions, whilst they might, might not necessarily seem researchable to a researcher, they're valid and they're also quite a lot different from what we might assume is important things to research or are important things to research. Um, I suppose that one of the last things that I'd maybe take ask people to consider is how, how they how they bring that into their own research, you know, how do they bring the service user voice into their research? Uh, maybe I'll jump in there. <clears throat> I think I, I'm, I'm I, I think I'm very much in, in in step with what Jay is saying. I think we need to be much more radical, actually. I think um, the problem with bringing people into research is, is that you're you're immediately creating a, a differential between, you know, you're allowing them, you're bringing them in, you're the person who's in charge, you're controlling what is going on. It's fantastic. And actually, we've done this quite a lot on our studies to have service users as part of our teams, as part of co-applicants and as data collectors. Uh, and that's 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 fantastic. That brings a lot of richness to studies that probably wouldn't have had that richness before. But I don't think it's it's anywhere near enough. I think what we have to get to a situation is is where there are sufficiently number uh, num and sufficient number of people who are trained, who have had experience of using mental health services, who are trained as researchers to develop their own ideas, to come up with their own questions, to do their own research. And we need to have a funding stream that allows those people to do that sort of work. And we're not there. I know of many people who are who are training, who are recently uh, uh, have have become, uh, you know, I've got PhDs, etc., or are on the, on the process of getting PhDs to be trained researchers. But we we are far away from where we need to be. And I suppose, you know, I came into the profession into mental health nursing over 30 years ago. And if 30 years ago, somebody had said that to me, I would have been bowled over. So we have made a massive. We have made a massive step in that time to a certain extent, but it isn't sufficient and it doesn't kind of address what are contemporary problems really. And I think we we um, we now need to sort of get a bit more energy behind that and move it much quicker. So I, th I think what you're saying is that you envisage a future in 10 years time where, you know, I asked you about services in 10 years time, but this is about research in 10 years time. And you envisage a, a situation where um, the research organizations are co-run by service users. Yeah, well, I mean, we've already got, I mean, uh, Jay mentioned uh, Diana and, uh, uh, yeah. and, you know, people, and there are people out there, you know, Alison Faulkner, people like that who are doing research, who are trained, who are interested and, and are coming up with great stuff. Uh, and it's just, we need a lot more people uh, because the voice is quite a small voice compared to, you know, the size of psychiatry, you know, and psychiatry is only a small bit in the whole health service. So, you know, yeah. you can that. it can be quite, it can quite easily be relegated or sidelined or forgotten about. And I suppose just for, for you, Gary, how does that, 
I think, this is something and you're working with very vulnerable groups. Yeah, I think I think these are really interesting questions. I, and I, I kind of I, I agree and like the points that the other contributors uh, have been making about this. It's and I, I think it's very important that we that we have a research program that's balanced. And I think you do need mixed methodologies if you're going to understand things properly. And that involves a, a combination of qualitative and quantitative methodologies as appropriate. So in our computer games, an important part of our evaluations are simply asking people, what was it like to do that? And actually, did you learn what we intended you to learn? By simply asking you that, as opposed to having a kind of a more quantitative sense of, of those things. So they're, they're vitally important, but I think more broadly, um, for me, I think of science as a process of observation, theory development and theory testing. And I think you develop your observations of, your, of the world through largely qualitative methodologies. So it's listening to the voices of survivors. That's people like us sitting around and thinking about how do we think the world works. And then we develop a theory about that, which we test using both quantitative and qualitative methodologies. So I, I think uh, our science is poorer when we neglect one side of that. Uh, and, and, I, and I suppose a strength that qualitative methodologies bring that quantitative methodologies don't is that I think they keep us in touch with the humanity of the experience of the people who were, were, were developing theories and programs and interventions for, and they're, they're vital in that regard. So, well, thanks, Gary. So um, you've been lucky enough to have the last word because we're just out of time. <laughs> um, I'd just like to thank all the panel members, Joy who had to leave early, Ben who's been working away in the background, um, Michael, Jay and Gary and, and Andre of course. Um, looking forward to seeing you all in Cardiff next week um, for a really, really fun and informative two days um, of mental health, imagination, invention and innovation. <laughs>